Today I will be talking about the excavation of Sea Henge. My name is Neil Moss. I'm a professional archaeologist with more than 30 years of experience and I was one of the archaeologists who was present during the field work on the beach at home next to sea. The site continues to generate a lot of opinion and comment even after more than 20 years. Many of the timbers are displayed in a permanent exhibition at Kings Lynn Museum and with some currently on loan to the British Museum exhibition, The World of Stonehenge. There has been renewed focus on the excavation and the associated events. Some new video content has already begun to appear on YouTube that seems to misunderstand many of the key issues. This talk is my personal perspective drawn purely from my recollections. I do not intend to embellish the account with ideological perspective and unqualified opinion, and this will be an opportunity to hear a first-hand account of the events from the inside. At the time of this talk, it has been over 20 years since the events at home, so it is probably necessary to begin with some of the background to the story. During the summer of 1998, whilst walking on a remote section of the beach in northwest Norfolk in eastern England, a local man and amateur archaeologist noticed a striking pattern of stubby, decaying timbers protruding from the sediment at low tide. Earlier, whilst walking the same beach nearby, he had found a rare and ancient remnant from prehistory in the form of a Bronze Age Pulstave axe. He was intrigued at the possible significance of the timbers he saw and duly reported the presence of the structure to the Norfolk County Archaeological Service. It is not known quite when the timbers first eroded from the beach and became visible, but it seems likely from anecdotal information that it was at least partially visible during 1987. A visual inspection could not conclude much but there was speculation as to whether it was part of an Anglo-Saxon fish trap, which are known from areas such as this along the Norfolk coast. An invitation from English Heritage to evaluate the site was made, and this was undertaken by the Norfolk Archaeological Unit during the autumn of 1998. The unit no longer exists, but it was at that time a private contracting business concerned with archaeological excavation and recording contracts and staff were not involved in any curatorial or decision making to do with this matter and was quite separate from any policy discussion. A survey was conducted which included photographs and after a careful manual cleaning by trowel a hand-drawn plan was made. An evaluation trench was dug across the inside of the structure and a narrow trench excavated on the outside of the circle, radially to the north. An auger bore was used to collect soil samples from inside and outside the structure and in the surrounding areas. Samples were taken from the central tree and four of the surrounding timbers and were submitted for dendrochronological dating. These were the samples that were likely to provide a definitive date for the structure as no other clearly datable evidence was recovered during the evaluation. The sampling of the central tree has proved to be one of the more controversial aspects of the fieldwork. Initially, it was intended to use a core sample technique to recover a sample representing the entire growth ring sequence but after consultation with experts experienced in ancient waterlogged timber, the advice was that the only practical way of securing a sample of the entire sequence was to use a chainsaw to slice a narrow wedge from the timber. I must make it clear that this wasn't done blithely and it was conducted expertly to gather the required sample as discreetly as possible. During the excavation of the evaluation trench, 
a rope made from honeysuckle stem was uncovered around the central tree. Prehistoric rope of any kind is rare, but to find an example in situ is perhaps unique. In January of 1999, the site was featured on the front page of a national newspaper, which sparked intense media coverage and public interest. The local newspaper coined the term Sea Henge, which, whilst being inaccurate, soon became the widely accepted name. This publicity attracted many thousands of visitors over the following months. Beaches are by nature dynamic environments, subject to the action of tides and seasonal storms. The area of the site is actively eroding at present, but this erosion is episodic in nature, occurring largely during higher tides with an onshore wind. These events, most common during winter, erode sand from the dunes to the south of the beach, temporarily recharging the beach with sand, which then gradually disappears through wave action and coastal drift. Beneath the sand is a remnant layer of fibrous peat that formed during the Bronze Age, which overlies a silty mudflat salt marsh sediment visible in the background beyond the timbers. The peat layer is alive with mollusks and crustacea, providing valuable feeding grounds for seabirds. Resident birds included sandlings, godwits and oyster catchers, amongst others. The beach at Holmlitzer Sea is on the migratory route of the knot, Calidris canutus. It is situated inside a national nature reserve and has triple SI status. It is recognised as a wetland of international importance under the Ramsar Convention and has special protection area status. Pressure was growing on the delicate balance of the environment at home. The number of visitors to the beach was having a disturbing impact on the wildfowl and the action of footfall was accelerating the erosion of the peat deposits on the beach. Meanwhile, preliminary analysis of the samples taken from the timbers indicated a Bronze Age prehistoric date. A range of possible management options were being considered, which included preservation in situ. The ongoing erosion of the coast would have meant the construction of some form of localised sea defence, which would be expensive, short term and likely to have the unintended consequence of accelerating erosion of neighbouring deposits. Ultimately, discussions between the custodians of the beach and English Heritage concluded that the removal of the timbers by means of a full archaeological excavation was in the best interests of the nature reserve and that this should be completed before the beginning of the annual migration in autumn. Continuing media coverage of events and the announcement of a forthcoming excavation sparked the interest of Channel 4's Time Team television programme. However, it was likely that the arrival of a full-scale TV production crew and ancillary services would add significantly to the disruption at the beach not to mention the added public interest this would generate. In the end, a compromise was agreed whereby a single camera operator and sound engineer would attend and unobtrusively document the dig. This would eventually air in December of 1999 as a special which included a reconstruction. The site itself lay within the intertidal zone allowing access only during low tides. The tides vary across the month being at their largest during full moon and no moon. Weather conditions also have a significant impact on the tidal range. Onshore winds can tend to keep the tide in as can low pressure systems. Conversely offshore and high pressure can work to produce lower tides and for greater duration. The team of archaeologists from Norfolk Archaeological Unit returned to the beach in May 1999 
to begin the process of recording and excavating the timbers. It was immediately clear that the site had been battered by the winter storms, with numerous fragments having been lost from the exposed areas of the timbers. Tides cycle twice each lunar day, or every 12 hours and 25 minutes. It was going to be necessary to work during every other tide, meaning that each day's work would be starting 50 minutes later than the previous day. An interesting work cycle to be sure. This pattern would continue until the selected tide had progressed into darkness. The use of lights to work through night tides was not considered reasonable or practical, so the next available tide that could be worked would be the subsequent tide which was by then in the morning. This would prove to be quite a challenge to the body clock and the excavation team soon adopted something of a maritime life rhythm. Most archaeological sites attract a degree of public interest. However, the ongoing publicity and publicly accessible location saw many thousands of visitors over the coming months. For safety's sake and the protection of the delicate peat areas from the increasing foot traffic, a rope cordon was erected that allowed a close view of proceedings whilst avoiding the most sensitive areas. The proceedings had also attracted some criticism from various points of interest. There was a perception among some that the site was being removed for purely academic reasons and that the views of local people had not been sought or were being ignored. It is indeed fair to say that local residents were made aware of the decision to excavate just before the process was begun during a meeting. In addition, pagan groups, most notably Druids, were opposed to the excavation as a desecration of a sacred site. It's interesting to reflect that the timbers were already 2000 years old and very likely not visible during the late Iron Age era when Druids were documented by Roman accounts. A prominent local plant hire businessman and magistrate also joined the criticism, adding his voice to the protests championing the idea that it was best left where it was. Another regular attendee was the chair of the local parish council who was also opposed to the removal of the timbers from the beach. I understand that some opponents were hoping to make use of the site as a visitor attraction. My impression however is that the vast majority of people who visited the beach were neither pro nor anti, merely fascinated by the opportunity to see something rather unique in an extraordinary location and to have a clear view of an archaeological excavation. At this stage I think it's important to clarify the issues surrounding the decision to excavate and also my understanding of the legal position with regard to who had the right to allow or deny the decision. In law a landowner also owns archaeological artefacts within their property. Generally the intertidal zone of UK beaches is owned by Crown Estates. Home Beach, including the intertidal zone however, is owned by grant of William I by the Lestrange Estate. By permission of the Lestrange Estate, Home Beach has been managed as a natural, national nature reserve and the preservation and maintenance of the area for wildlife was paramount in the decision. The decision had been made to excavate and recover the timbers from the beach and the archaeological team were allowed access to the beach between May and August as this was the window of opportunity during which the migratory knot was in Siberia. For these reasons and from a logistical perspective, it was crucial to begin the excavation as soon as possible once the decision to proceed had been reached. In planning a schedule, it was impossible to be certain just how many low tide events would afford a usable time period, and we were aware just how easily the program could slip. There were 55 posts in an ellipse rather than a circle with a single large tree in the middle 
slightly to the southwest of centre. The central tree was in fact upside down with its roots uppermost. The single horizontal timber visible in this view is from a nearby shipwreck, the Vicuna, a cargo vessel carrying ice bound for Hull, which was driven aground during storms in March of 1883. The remains of the Vicuna proved to be a good source of mussels when the tide allowed. The Seahenge timbers were situated within a shallow depression which had been scoured by wave action, completely removing the peat from the immediate environs of the timbers. Furthermore, this meant that the ground level, which would have been contemporary with the construction of the timber circle, was also lost along with any deposition related to the U-South and activities associated with the timbers after the construction. The excavation would nevertheless need to be conducted in such a way as to establish the construction technique and to examine and collect any debris or detritus associated with this, in addition to the recovery of the timbers. It was clear to see that even after the tide had receded enough to reveal the site, there was sea water remaining within the area. A petrol sludge pump was employed to remove this. Appropriate measures were taken to ensure no contamination of the beach from accidental leaks by placing the pump entirely within a fish crate and conducting all maintenance away from the beach. First task, as with any archaeological investigation, was to clean the area of the excavation so that the initial surface could be examined for any visual indications of different soils or infilled material across the area. Naturally, we were aware of the possibility of the structure having been built by a construction trench technique, and if this were visible from the surface, it would significantly influence our excavation strategy. Sadly, there was no indication at all to be seen of any infilled material to suggest the use of a construction trench. Perhaps the timbers had been driven into the silty subsoil rather than placed within a trench. A system of radial trenches was devised which allowed access to two of the outer timbers at a time and enabled the subsoil to be diligently excavated and recorded in vertical section. This was the maximum amount of work that could be expected during the low tide. Close attention was paid to examine the excavated materials for artefacts or plant materials that may have become incorporated during the construction. One of the advantages of a vertical section through archaeological deposits is that it affords the opportunity to see stratified deposits or cut features that were invisible from the surface. In this case, many of the sections examined showed little differentiation and no clear trench profile. Once all recording and analysis was complete, the matter of the recovery of the timbers themselves presented its own challenges. It was decided that it would be impractical to try to transport the timbers in the vertical position, so a method was devised to safely rotate the timbers through 90 degrees and then lift bodily on a stretcher for transport. A canvas stretcher was suitably padded and offered up against the timber on its inner side and an improvised harness fashioned from ropes and an empty sandbag was positioned beneath the timber and secured to the stretcher handles. In this way, the timbers were gently rotated backwards and removed without jarring or imparting any damage to the surfaces of the wood. Meanwhile, a careful watch had to be kept on the approach of the returning tide. A certain amount of time was needed to conclude operations in a considered and timely fashion. No equipment could remain on site during the high tide and any excavations would need to be concluded tidily. Any loose materials or objects, even if non-buoyant, could be moved bodily by the waves and the action of the incoming tide damaging the timbers and sides of the excavated areas. At the end of each day, 
two carefully coddled timbers were loaded on to a Land Rover and taken to Flag Fen, where large water tanks and, crucially, the expertise of the Fenland Archaeological Trust were on hand to store the timbers while the gradual process of stabilisation and desalination of the timbers could begin. Whilst the excavation team endeavoured to settle into something approaching a routine, the number of visitors was continuing to grow, especially when the tide coincided with a suitably agreeable time of day. To ensure that distractions on site were kept to a minimum, a member of staff was employed largely full time on accommodating the many questions. You will probably already have guessed that member of staff was me. Keen as we were not to add to the publicity surrounding the site, the cat was well and truly out of the bag and we produced a small leaflet to distribute to visitors. Each day we returned tied to the tide tables in anticipation of the resumption of the process. Mostly the tide would behave as predicted, but as I previously mentioned, around the half moon or on occasions of low pressure and or a north wind, the tide would be slow to retreat and failed to clear the site area at all. When the tide did allow, one thing soon became clear, the daily submersion would bring a variety of sea life into the excavation. I recall the sea being an opaque brown algae rich fluid one time, soon followed by baby lobsters or similar nymph crustacea by the thousands, and this just within the flooded areas of the site. Various crabs and forms of seaweed added to the variety of life we carefully lifted into buckets to be carried back to sea. In all, the process of pumping and baling often used nearly half of the available time. As the site progressed, an unlikely alliance developed between local concerns and the New Age pagan protest, and a frequent visitor was a former British Army soldier turned modern Druidic tree advocate, visible here on the right, I am to the left. He spent many hours shadowing the dig, volubly adding his rather angry perspective, which included some of his poetry. At times, he would present his counter arguments to members of the public who were visiting the site. Both public interest and the activities of the protesters were growing as the days passed, and good summer weather plus saturation local media coverage drew growing numbers of people to the beach. Once sufficient progress had been made so as to remove a significant arc of the surrounding ring of timbers, the task of recovering the central upturned tree bowl was approaching. In order to achieve this without causing collateral damage to the site, it wasn't logistically possible by muscle power alone. For this operation alone, a tracked machine excavator was the only option to achieve a clean vertical lift of the stump. We were aware that the lifting of the stump would represent something of a watershed moment and prepared ourselves for the task ahead. Whilst always in plain view, we were careful not to discuss our work programme openly for obvious reasons. Nonetheless, it seems that the chosen date was discovered or leaked and nothing could have prepared us for the events that followed. What follows is my best recollection of a single day during the excavation of Seahenge. This took place over 20 years ago, but is still quite vivid in memory, and I trust that I have the precise sequence of events correctly ordered. On arrival, some of the team proceeded to the site to begin the routine of emptying the site of water as the tide receded. Additional members of the team stayed back to escort the machine excavator which had to track some distance along the upper beach to reach the site. By this time, many protesters, interested bystanders and two local police officers were in attendance. Anticipation was high whilst the remaining water was cleared and large timber boards were laid in place to provide protection to the beach 
and to support the machine excavator. Around this time, I became aware of two things. Firstly, the noise of a large engine droning somewhere to the west began to drown out all but raised voices. It wasn't clear if it was a boat or an aeroplane, perhaps. Secondly, the local plant hire businessman's voice was heard as he challenged the legality of the method we were using to lift the stump. To add to the frenetic events, a shouting confrontation erupted between the former soldier, now Druid, and a visiting member of the senior management at NAU, himself a former soldier. Meanwhile, the cacophony from the west had become a deafening, and around the headland a massive amphibious vehicle appeared, heading towards the assembly. As it drew up, it was met by the local constabulary, and a conversation took place. Once calm had been restored, a discussion between the excavation team and our machine operator concluded that whilst we were certain that no regulations were being breached with regard to the lifting operation, the turn of the tide was imminent and it was sensible to treat the day as a dry run and to return another day to complete the lift. The massive amphibious vehicle noisily departed, not to be seen again. As we stood down for the day, the Druids and Neo-Pagans, finding themselves no longer being actively restrained from the area, chose to enter the site and many climbed, chanting onto the stump in a symbolic victory. The Archdruid of Britain then took centre stage to read out an appeal critical of English heritage and claiming the site as a place of worship sacred to the Druids. It was some time before the rising tide could deny them their podium and it was during these moments that the Director of English Heritage joined them to hear their arguments and to explain face to face why it was necessary to proceed with the excavation and removal of the timbers and slowly the tide reclaimed the site to the sea and peace returned to the beach. Following the failed attempt to recover the central tree legal advice was sought both by English Heritage regarding the powers available to allow the lawful activities of the excavation team to continue without interference and also by the excavation team themselves as to the lawfulness of the lifting technique by mechanical excavator. Meanwhile the team returned to the process of recording and recovering the remaining outer timbers in comparative peace. In due course, English Heritage sought and were granted legal injunctions upon key individuals who had intent to continue to act against the dig. This included three Druids and the local chair of the parish council who successfully challenged this and the injunction was removed as he had never directly acted to disturb or interfere with the dig himself. With some of the key antagonists now unable to interfere, and confirmation that it was perfectly legal to lift the stump by machine, the second visit with the machine was made to successfully lift the central tree. Again, there was a large audience attending, including more neo-pagans to bear witness and make their feelings known. This included a group of white witches who it seemed were present to promote healing and reconciliation. After the dramatic dress re rehearsal, the procedure of clearing the site of water and detritus and preparation for the arrival of the machine went ahead smoothly. The timber boards were again placed in position and with extensive padding surrounding the tree, a harness was secured around it. As the machine took the strain of the weight of the tree and the considerable suction from the surrounding silts, a woman rushed through the surrounding rope barrier and ran towards the scene, only to be tackled to the ground. Police then duly escorted her from harm's way and released her once the tree was safely suspended beneath the excavator arm. Examining the portions of the tree stump that had hitherto been hidden in the ground, it was clear that more of the honeysuckle rope was still in position and that it was threaded through some towing holes made by the original builders. Examination of the now vacant hole 
left by the extraction showed no additional infill with the only find from beneath the tree stump being a single hazelnut. Whilst these investigations continued, the tree began its slow progress along the beach to where it could be loaded onto a purpose-built saddle to secure it for transportation to Flag Fen. Back at the site, once the recording process had concluded and the team had begun the routine of withdrawing equipment before the return of the tide, some of the neo-pagans were permitted to enter the area. One individual deposited a tomato into the vacant hole. The woman who had been tackled to the ground was asked if she wanted to place anything, to which she replied, only her tears. From my recollection, the few remaining outer timbers were all recovered during very early morning tidal events and as such proceeded without drama. The final two timbers were recorded and lifted in relative calm surroundings and I even managed to assist extensively as the public relations duties were not needed. I'd like to add a couple of notable incidents that were not related directly to the dig. During the initial survey in autumn 1998, an electrical storm passed over the beach and the team had to make a rapid retreat to the car after one team member was seen with their hair being electrostatically repulsed in the fashion of a dandelion clock. Anyone who has witnessed a school demonstration of a Van de Graaff generator will know just how this appears. There was another incident during the main excavation, which I find difficult to remember when it happened precisely, but as I recall, it was on a day when there were few, if any, visitors. During the Second World War, the dunes at home had been the backstop to a firing range. Remains are still visible from structures that were used to tow targets to provide gunnery practice for the coastal batteries to the south. Consequently, the dunes are full of fragmentary and occasionally unexploded shells. A particularly high tide and a significant northerly wind caused the sea to wash against the dunes at the top of the beach, liberating and distributing many pieces across the sand. This is a regular occurrence and bomb disposal crews are required to make the beach safe for the public. Interestingly, because the suspect materials were within the intertidal zone, it was under the jurisdiction of the Royal Navy and a team arrived on the beach to collect both live shells and fragments for safe disposal. After carrying their haul some distance to the east towards Thornham, they placed some explosives of their own and detonated the lot dramatically producing a large fountain of sand. Following the fieldwork, the process of analysis of the timbers and recorded data and materials from the various types of samples taken from the site and surrounding area during the excavation began. Amongst the materials examined were prehistoric pottery, fired clay, stone, bone, plant macrofossils, insects and pollen. Block samples were also examined by X-ray, magnetic susceptibility and for both soil micromorphology and sediment diagenesis and taphonomy. There was also microscopic analysis of the Ostracoda and Foraminifera, tiny crustaceans and single celled organisms. Many of the more substantial organic remains were radiocarbon dated. These studies enabled a broader picture of the human activities in the area and assisted in characterizing the nature of the landscape into which the structure was built. The timbers themselves were being gradually and gently cleaned and desalinated at Flag Fen. The various ways that they had been cut and shaped were examined and recorded in detail. The tool marks on the timbers are probably the largest assemblage from the early Bronze Age recorded in Britain, as many as 59 separate axes left their marks. 
but given some close similarities between some, a figure of 51 is likely more accurate. Evidence suggests the number of trees used in the construction as a whole could be as many as 25. However, it could be as few as 15. We have evidence that between 50 to 80 people could have been involved in felling the trees, and it is possible that more were engaged in the rope making and the hauling of the trees to the site. Add in the digging of the construction trenches, the erection of the timbers, and supplying food and drink suggests a sizable group of people were involved. The dendrochronological examination of the tree stump revealed a ring growth sequence that was compared to a library of similar samples collected over the years. It was not found to match or overlap any existing patterns. Consequently, a series of precision radiocarbon samples were collected and using a Bayesian statistical method of analysis, the date for the felling of the central tree was established at 2049 BC during the early Bronze Age period. The location of the site at the time of the construction wasn't on the shore, but in a salt marsh, close to the point of the highest spring tides. The dune system we see today may have been present some kilometre or more to the north, and higher ground a similar distance to the south. On a flattish plain with little topsoil and sparse vegetation, the structure, which quite possibly stood up to two metres high, would have been quite visible from a distance in the landscape. The structure was built with the outer timbers bark outermost, and with a single narrow gap through which it was likely possible to access the interior. Rather than being a circle, the structure forms an ellipse with the long axis aligned from southeast to northwest. However, perhaps the more informative alignment is between the narrow entrance and a single roundward post opposite. It is possible, if not probable, that this was a deliberate alignment to the rising midsummer sun to the northeast and the midwinter setting sun to the southwest. The central tree was inverted and not a casual thing to achieve. There are associations from other Bronze Age sites to link inversion with funerary practice, and it surely cannot be anything less than a hugely significant action. So, what was Seahenge? Why was it built at such considerable effort over 4,000 years ago? We can only speculate, but that shouldn't stop us from doing just that. Perhaps the central tree was used as an excarnation platform, such that a body may have been placed there to allow the flesh to be scavenged by birds in a form of sky burial, subsequently to collect the larger bones that remained for further ritual purposes. It may have been that the tree itself that was being buried in this dramatic inversion, or that the inverted tree allowed those sensitive to such to form a link to the world of the dead and to send or receive messages. Whatever were the purposes of the builders of Seahenge and our struggle to understand it, I'm left wondering how much more difficult would it have been for those early Bronze Age tree inverters to understand the fuss and furore it was to cause some 4,000 years later. Here is a view of the conserved central tree stump, and you can see the timbers at Kingsland Museum, where Seahenge has pride of place in a permanent exhibition. I will bring this talk to a conclusion with this image of the extraordinary team who excavated this extraordinary site in such extraordinary circumstances.